everyone for coming along to uh, our second seminar uh, uh, in our uh, citizen science and crowdsource data and evidence network. I always have to look down and actually read that because I can't keep it all in my head at the same time. Um, and it's fantastic that uh, we've got such a big programme of events lined up um, and uh, we're very pleased to have our second seminar based uh, around some work that's uh, the important work that's happening here in the library. Um, and we're going to be hearing from um, uh, Gavin, Scott and Claire about uh, their, their efforts to curate um, digital images within the library uh, using citizen sites uh, for crowdsourcing approaches. Um, so we're going to, uh, I think we're going to hear a presentation and then yeah. we're going to get a demonstration. Yeah. Uh, would you like to fill us in a bit more about the, rather than me <laughs> mumbling? Okay. Thank so, you very much. Right. Um, thank you for coming to the library and there's no fire alarm. So if the fire goes, head downstairs as quickly as possible. Um, and also it's nice to have some toilet here. You can go at any time and ask questions at any time of us. And, um, and the plan is that Scott, Gavin and I are going to give a brief presentation and then we've arranged for a tour of the CRC so you can see some of our treasures and the conservation areas, etc., and have a look around what's at the top of this library building that not everybody visits. And um, we're going to give a talk about what we've been doing for crowdsourcing with image metadata, and this talk's sort of modified one I gave two weeks ago at the Open Repositories Conference um, in Indianapolis, which is why you'll notice there's more names on the bottom, and that's because we've been working with Tilt Factor at Dartmouth College, so to credit those, what we've been doing. So we've been looking at crowdsourcing of image metadata. So, and we're going to talk about the who, what, why, when, how. So who are the crowd that we're addressing? What are we collecting from the crowd? Why are we collecting from the crowd? When are we taking what we've collected from them and putting it back into our source systems? And how we're hoping that the metadata tags will help us that we're collecting. So who are we? Well, this is this delightful building that we're in, that opened in 1967, I've been doing some research, and was at that time the biggest academic library in the UK. And we're part of Library and University Collections. So we're based within the building, and we look after the Library and University Collections. So that's the research collections, special collections, museum collections, and the teaching collections. So that's a lot of e-books, academic books, tech books, etc. That's all part of the division we're in within information services, so part of the support groups for the university. And last year was a big project for us of getting our collections online. Obviously we've got amazing collections in the university but they haven't always been accessible online so it's a big thing for us to let people know what we've got and to get that available. So last year we launched collections online with four collections and that was our musical instrument collection. I'm not sure if you're all aware that we have an amazing world-renowned musical instrument collection. We have the most famous harpsichord in the world. At the moment, we're doing a big redevelopment of St. Cecilia's Hall, which we've got heritage lottery funding for. So that's one of our collections we launched last year. Our art collection, we have a big art collection, which has grown a lot since our merger with Edinburgh College of Art. We've got over 3,500 art collect in our art collection. Often what you see around your buildings is part of our art collection. We try to get it out as much as possible, but we wanted people to be able to see that in one place online. A lot of it's digitised, but not all of it, so some of it's metadata-only records. And then recently we've launched our iconic collection. So that's our top iconic items. As you can imagine, the curators had lots of fun deciding what the top 50 items in our collections were. I'm not sure they've quite agreed. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And we also have our exhibitions. We've got an exhibition room downstairs where we have a rolling exhibition programme. This summer, Dolly the Sheep is coming to the library. We've got her for the summer as part of our exhibition programme. She'll be sat downstairs in the exhibition room and which is why the festival's going on, so we're hoping that will get lots of people into the library. And it's, the, it's really amazing, the diversification of our exhibitions, and we try to get that all online so people can see the wide range of collections that we do have within the university. So Tilt Factory, who we've been working with, they're a research group based at Dartmouth College under Mary Flanagan. So they're based, they do online games, but also they do board games, and looking at lots of social issues, um, awareness and looking at different things and trying to address them through board games and online games. They've got a game called Awkward Situation where you play it and you're challenged about your perceptions, etc. 
they're doing lots of really interesting things. And they contacted us when we put our games online to find out what we were doing, and they've been really invaluable to us, giving us advice, and also telling us we're awesome, <laughs> which is great when somebody's like, yeah, what you're doing is great. So it kind of has kept the memento going with what we're doing. And now I'm going to hand it to Scott. It's Gavin. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm um, Gavin Wilshaw, I'm a digital curator here at um, the library. Um, I think one thing we didn't mention is that after we do our talk, we've got a couple of laptops at the back, um, so you can all kind of, if you want to have a little shot of the of, uh, trying out the activity that we've designed. So hopefully what we're talking about now will sort of put a lot of that in context. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about what we mean by crowdsourcing and kind of some of the activities that we've been involved in. I think. Um, crowdsourcing is a term that can mean quite a lot of things to quite a lot of different people. So I think when we're looking at crowdsourcing, um, we're not we're, we're kind of moving away from the idea of a kind of an anonymous crowd and just kind of exploiting the labour of an anonymous crowd. We're much more interested in looking at crowdsourcing as a group of people with um, similar interests, <coughs> all kind of working together to develop something for the public good. Um, so we're not just Kind of splitting the word crowdsourcing into the crowd, the large group, and sourcing being the outsourcing of work and labour to that group. Um, we're much more interested in crowdsourcing um, done by knowledge communities, um, so volunteers, citizen scientists, citizen archivists, um, in our situation, all of whom are working together to produce and develop and refine the metadata of our image collections. Um, we see crowdsourcing as a, a way to interact with community, the people who maybe haven't um, interacted with the collections before, and they're all developing new knowledge together. So with that in mind, we um, started out kind of thinking about different ways that we could engage with communities to improve our metadata. Um, our, in our original intention behind trying to come up with a game for this was that a lot of our digital images have very poor metadata online. Um, a lot of the images are, have been digitised because a reader has requested for them to be digitised, so they've paid money and the image has gone online. So the metadata that we do have about the objects tends to come from like, the book itself, so we'll get the, the title of the book, the author of the book, the year of publication, that sort of thing, but nothing that actually describes the image on the page itself. Um, so that was one of the original um, reasons for starting this, and also, and also developing new metadata, enriching current metadata. But we've also found that um, developing games as opposed to other activities has been a really good way to engage with different communities. And, and we're hopeful that, that this kind of activity will lead to and has led to the reuse and discovery of our, our digital image collections. So in terms of the games we've developed, um, they've offered so far they've offered us a large amount of data. Um, I think you can see at the top there, Tilt Factor, they really are kind of leading the way in the world in this kind of activity. Um, we have uploaded um, some of our images to Tilt Factor's own platform and we've received 13,000 tags um, from our images on that platform. And even from our own platform, which um, we only only went public really sort of two, three months ago and was only launched internally towards the end of last year, we already got nine and a half, uh, over 9,000 tags from 150 users. Um, and then just on the the word cloud you can see there, this is this was uh, derived from an event that we did during Innovative Learning Week. So this is just an example of some of the tags that we got. Um, we selected a discrete selection of images from the art collection. And you can see the sort of words that people put in, sculpture, painting, um, but also things describing what people could actually see in the images themselves, such as balcony, um, shirt, sky, that sort of thing. So just very simple tags, but very useful for us. Um, so the next couple of slides just give an example of some of the images that we have in our collections that that probably need this treatment because they do lack good descriptive um, tags. This one here is an image um, of Isaac Newton's diagrams, and if you look down at the bottom, there's lots of metadata about the um, the book from which it <coughs> came, such as the author of the book, the, the date of publication, even the shelf marks there. But there's nothing. There's no mention of triangles or circles or anything like that, so if you, somebody was trying to search for that image, it would be very difficult because they wouldn't have those tags in the database. Similarly, this one from the art exhibition, sorry, from the art collection. Again, along the right-hand side, you can see lots of curatorial information about the artist, the date it was made, and which collection it belongs to, but nothing about the actual picture itself. There's no mention of 
the fish tank or the tree anywhere in the metadata. So it's kind of a couple of examples of the issues that we've faced. Um, so as well as that, we then had to think about which kind of community, communities we wanted to engage with this activity. Um, as you can see on the screen behind me, there's a huge range of communities, ranging from academic researchers through to members of the public. I think uh, so far we've more been working with students and members of the public, um, but we feel that there's an almost limitless number of different groups who probably would be interested in, in this. Um, we're even thinking about trying to set up a, an event to get um, high school children to try out the game and see what sort of tags they enter, uh, enter and also um, sort of what they think about our images and that sort of thing. So it's another group that we've never really engaged with in that sense. Um, and I think it's also just really important that the onus is very much on us to go out there and engage with people. People aren't just going to kind of come to us. We need to think about who we want to target. Um, and then this point that it's great to have a fantastic um, game, really good tools developed, but if you're not actually engaging with people and finding people who are interested in it, then there's really no point in doing it. So that, that's an area that we're really trying to focus on. So then, because of these kind of varied, varied groups of people who might be interested in taking part, um, gaming seems to be a good way of, of, of trying to gain, gain some, uh, gauge some interest. Um, in particular, it really seems to be a really good way of getting people interested who might not have been interested before. Um, so on the screen here, there's lots of examples of, of different games. Most of them have been developed by the, metadata, uh, by the Tilt Factor platform, but this little one here is our very own creation, which we'll get to try out at the end. Um, there's different types of games. There's single player games where you basically just get given an image say what you see, type it into a box, you get points for that, however many tags you enter, and you're kind of competing with yourself to see what score you can get. Um, there's also multiplayer games, such as um, this one called Guess What, which has been developed by Tilt Factor, and it's kind of two players working collaboratively to try and tag images, um, and then you get more competitive games as well. So there's quite a, a sort of diverse range of things, it's not just, they're not all the same thing. Um, and Tilt Factor in particular are looking at games, not just looking at tagging, but also at ways you can improve OCR um, verification and also looking at things like transcription. So it's kind of beginning to move on now just from the simple tagging of images into other areas, which is really interesting for us. Um, and we've found that in order to engage people, one of the best ways so far we've, we've found is to try and kind of set up an actual event somewhere um, to, to engage people that attention. We found that trying to identify events that are already happening, particularly the university, and trying to sort of piggyback onto those so during Innovative Learning Week, we had some sessions where we went to um, ECA and to KB um, during the pop-up library that we ran at the start of last um, academic year. We did some sessions there, so kind of really good to build on something that's already there rather than trying to start something from scratch. Um, we found that engaging also well, sometimes requires a bit of um, bit of reward. So we provided coffee vouchers when we first started doing it. We gave kind of coffees to people to take part. Um, lollipops for top scores, postcards, and that kind of thing. But we've kind of realized the more we've done it that I think we were a little bit overly pessimistic at the start, thinking that people would need to have some kind of big, tangible um, reward for taking part, whereas most people seem to just kind of quite enjoy just doing it for the sake of it, um, which is, again, really good for us. We've also tried to make it competitive by putting up kind of uh, top scoreboards, in which update in real time so people can compare themselves with. Uh, with their friends and kind of that, that definitely spurred people on quite a bit um, and um, I think we found that when you're doing an event like this it's really important to kind of focus on a discrete discrete collection rather than taking the whole lot all the images it's been really good to kind of take, take one such as the art collection and, and build an event around that particular collection um, and we found that engaging with communities in this way has been really useful in a number of ways. It's obviously increased the number of people using the, um, the platform, which has been great. It's widened participation. So I think uh, an event that we did at the public library a few weeks ago, um, we had somebody who was about, I think, 15, year old, 15 years old taking part, and there's also a guy in his 70s. So we really are sort of trying to appe um, appeal to as big a range of people as possible. Um, these events like this give us really useful feedback for improvements for the next iteration of the games. And another big one, I think, is that um, getting people involved in this kind of frees up staff time to do other things. If we weren't getting people tagging the images, uh, images, then we probably wouldn't even have paid a member of staff to do that um, themselves. So it frees up a lot of time. And just an example here, this, this graph sort of shows the 
the impact that having a, an event can have. Um, the big red bar in the middle shows the number of tags that we got on the day of our event at Central Library compared to the sort of two or three that we got either side of that. So we found that's a, a really good way of engaging with people. And I think I'll hand over to Scott now. <coughs> Okay, uh, if I slip into uh, the kind of uh, the, the less altruistic bit about uh, um, outsourcing free labour, I do apologise, but that's very much how, how we kind of started off with this. I think we, we, we started off with a, um, a little interface that was to be used internally to meet our needs, uh, and it's only since we've kind of got into it we've realised the benefits of crowdsourcing to everybody else and, and uh, the, the sort of more kind of two-way uh, action there. Um, okay, I'm just going to talk about our solution for this. Um, basically, this is a uh, just a quick look at a workflow. This is actually one that Tom Tom did, so it's not exactly what we did, but it's very very close to it, and uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the, the idea of design input. I think tag ban was something that came along a bit later. This idea of certain things that you need programmatically keep out uh, and getting stuff back in was well, pretty much what we were aiming for. So it's good to know that. To do it professionally, uh, are thinking the same ways as we are. Okay, uh, so this is what we kind of come up with. Um, basically, uh, it started off as a very basic sort of interface to be used internally by uh, pretty much by our photography staff who kind of do the basic cataloging of the images just to try and sort of beef up what was coming in. And it was only when these guys got involved that we started to think of, of gamifying it, as it were, and making it something more engaging for. for General. Uh, I think this is what's known in the, in the trade as a serious game, uh, and that is, uh, <laughs> at the outset, it's not necessarily seem to be that much fun, but uh, uh, I've, I've heard people use words like addictive to describe it, so uh, it's, it's good, good to know that once you get into it, 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 it actually is quite interesting. And what it does basically is it's a very straightforward uh, PHP by SQL interface with a link form on it, basically, just to get the stuff in it. As you data and submit it, another random image comes up, so it's, uh, you don't get any say in what you're working with. Uh, but uh, it's it's gone through a few iterations. Uh, it didn't always have the Space Invaders front end, that was uh, something Gavin thought of. Uh, and it's it's uh, it's quite good because uh, it's retro and it's simple, and it's, it's simple data that you're trying to get, so I, I quite like that idea. Uh, and also, we're down to one, one uh, entry field now. We did have several fields at one point for kind of person data, object data, category data. We just realised that that was overcomplicating it, I think. Although it's something that's quite useful to be able to uh, have that level of gran gran granularity. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this later on, but basically the sort of validation, the trustworthiness aspect of it is quite important to us. So we built in uh, a moderation module and voting modules where people can come along and vote on each other's uh, tags to say whether they're, they're any good or not, and that has a big say in whether we ultimately push the, the tags back into the, the host repository. So um, there are issues, we, we know the, the actual risk of what gets displayed and what comes in, and I think it's quite important that we uh, do actually think about, um, at least if nothing else, making sure that it's, it's very much noted on the metadata record that um, what we've gathered here is not academic, it's basically stuff that we've picked up from the public. They're effectively telling us what's in the pictures to improve search and to improve facets, and uh, we feel that's uh, probably the best way to do it. Uh, oops, I there, sorry, I'm not to uh, but uh, they, certainly for our image collections, because they're so sort of poorly catalogued in the first place, they basically have no descriptive metadata, we're not going to really do big on turning stuff away if we can help it. So uh, we are usually willing to take risks with a, a tight down policy on it. Uh, in terms of how we decide what goes in, we'll take a lot of tags in, obviously, from people. Uh, the moderation module will weed stuff out, uh, and then we've got this voting aspect. And we have this, uh, the, the logic is something that we've been working on a bit, but the current model sort of suggests that if it's been moderated and then it's had two votes up the way, that means it's acceptable to go into the host repository. If it's been voted, uh, if the particular tag has been voted down the way, 
uh, to a score of minus two, then it gets kicked out of the, the system and has a rejected tag, uh, which we feel is, uh, is one way of doing it. it it's, uh, there's, there's other things I've done. And then uh, we, we also have the, uh, the issue of uh, programmatically trying to kick stuff out. So uh, we have uh, stop words list, uh, there's, which I think are, are fairly standard, I think. It's little short words, uh, uh, conjunctions, that kind of thing. The uh, list turned here was the naughty words list. I was looking forward to the session where we got to build that list, but unfortunately, uh, Claire picked one up off the internet, so we didn't have to bother with that. Uh, long answers. It's amazing the number of people that see this and think you, you, they're expecting an essay, uh, which, which we're certainly not. We're just looking for uh, short, sharp, uh, descriptive words uh, and things like numerical tags. And then our curators gave us a list of things as well that they felt belonged somewhere else in the system, so uh, we keep these out as well. Now, integrating tags back into the host system is, is, is I suppose, basically the end all of all of this and uh, the guys at Tilt Factor have actually told us that uh, not very many of their clients have actually got as far as, as pushing stuff back so they, they were full of praise for the fact that we even thought about this. Uh, but basically we have built or are building a, a number of APIs depending on the, the kind of data that we're working with. So for the collection site that Claire showed you earlier on, uh, there's a, an API that we've built which uh, will basically push the stuff straight back into the what's known as the vSpace repository, the, the, the basic place for the stuff that is uh, sort of natively catalogued there. Uh, a very important one to us is the uh, Luna image service because that's the one that's really got very, very little data and that's the one that we need to get in if we haven't actually built one of them. And then we've got the, um, uh, the Vernon uh, Collections Management System which is the golden copy of their museum data. So we need to get the data back in there uh, only for ease of, of reloading at later dates. And uh, we've got a, a fair number of, given that, uh, you know, of the 10,000 tags that we've, or 9,000 I think that we've got through the, the system so far, uh, and the 13,000 that have come from Tilt Factor, we've, uh, a lot of them have not been voted on or moderated yet. So we've managed to push some back, but we've got a, a lot of work to do just to get those uh, back in in the first place. And the benefits of, of integrating the tags are basically, as far as we're concerned, uh, it's, it's about improving search, improving faceted, uh, enriching metadata and making the whole experience uh, for the users better. And what we've actually found, the, the kind of side benefit of this has been uh, the fact that we've got this. We, we've actually managed to, to use this to sort of network better with other people within the university, within the wider communities. And that, that's, that's been great because we didn't really uh, have any, anything to to go, go on with that, uh, on that kind of side of things. So, so from a, a softer side, that's been a, a real boon for us so far. Uh, and then just to go back to the, the images that Gavin uh, showed us earlier on, here's Isaac Newton's stuff again, uh, just to show you some of the, some of the results here. Uh, amazingly, we managed to get all this on, on some, uh, some triangles and circles, so uh, well done. Uh, that, that may be completely belittling Isaac Newton's work to uh, <laughs> that wee bit with the gaps, like loads of stuff on that. And then uh, this, this one here, Claire will talk a bit more about uh, the, the sort of comparison, sort of before and after kind of, kind of thing, but uh, we, we have seen people try and find this image just as a, as a, a challenge. Uh, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know too much about Gordon Mitchell. I, I don't know if reverse reserve is going to uh, necessarily get going to help you too much for this, this particular picture. There, there's really nothing else on that. But as soon as we added, uh, or, or the community added seascape, sea, fish tank and island, suddenly this becomes a uh, shoots right to the top of your search results. So it's, uh, it's worked quite well there. Uh, and then the overall impact, uh, I think, is, is something to uh, be thinking about. It's uh, due to the just the amount of work we've got to do to get stuff back in the collections and the time it takes for Google to index things. We're not really, we've not really seen the marked increase in traffic yet on, on, on our sites, but I think, uh, you know, we, we know that that's probably where it's heading. I mean, our uh, most visited site, the Peace Consumers, is, uh, is coincidentally, or not, not at all coincidentally, the, the best described. So uh, we, we expect that, uh, you know, once this all kind of kicks into gear, we should see increased traffic on, on the stuff that's getting added uh, on. 
and then uh, seeing where we go next. I mean, this has been, uh, it started off as a kind of standalone application, but we've worked it into a new site called Library Labs, uh, which is where we're kind of trying to put our sort of innovative stuff. Um, so that will be expanded into things like transcription games, paleography, uh, research zone, I think we're calling it. So more things more for the academic rather than necessarily for the layman. Uh, we've also got things like uh, looking at things like verification games, so just uh, more the kind of Zooniverse model, just basically saying, you know, with the kind of sort of almost uh, bullying kind of yes, no type things about, uh, uh, which we think we can use against our, our rocks collection. And then we've also got uh, other schools, so we've got the, uh, the physics department that are interested in putting their image archive out for one of these things that we're looking at to the guys at the uh, Centre for Sports and Exercise as well, who've got a, a vast uh, quantity of image and audio, uh, and just basically we're going to catalogue it for them so we think we can maybe help them out there. Uh, and then I think this is what we ultimately <laughs> would like to get to, a sort of less kind of serious game. This is one of Phil Factor's new ones uh, called Beanstalk, which uh, I don't know, based on the, uh, the classic pantomime you're, you're trying to build this. Uh, stock up to a castle at the end of the day. I think we, we will be um, hopefully uh, doing sort of slightly more interesting, more kind of fun things with the, with, with the, uh, with the metadata when we get to that point. But we're, I think we'll worry about the, the data first and sort of the edges and stuff thereafter. Okay, so to finish off with a bit more about sort of the research we've been doing with the tag we've created. So, um, what we did is once I'd got, we'd got the tags, I put them into our test system and then we had a session where we compared our test system with our live system which didn't have the tags in. So I took these 10 images, I took a random selection of images with not much metadata where we'd got tags and I put these on the screen and I gave yeah, everybody the challenge to find, find these images on our um, art collection and some of them nobody found, some of them you could find but after you press next 20 times. So we found a big impact in increasing the putting the tags in that people could find images, especially um, our nice fish tank one. That's my favourite example. This one with pipes. There was nothing in the metadata to say there was pipes in the image. So these sort of things made it a lot easier to find. Um, a lot of our abstracts, but they're quite interesting in that this one, I think we've got rabbit, cat. Yeah, there's lots <laughs> of things. I think there's a lot more interesting things you could do with some of the tags we've got. Um, and then also... Um, Christina Manzo has been working with Tilt Factor. These are images that Tilt Factor got from the Boston Public Library, which they put online. And she looked at how their tags help people find the images. So she did a bit, a bit more of an academic study than me and found that this was the decrease in the search time that happened once people, their tags were taken so many groups that the tags were added to their metadata. So people found the items a lot easily. And people also didn't give up on searching. Quite often, if the tags weren't there, people just gave up with searching. They didn't go find them. And this this sort of came to me after the Zooniverse talk, in that we've been looking at a lot of our images and wondering what people passed in Tilt Factor. People can press pass on this turn. So I was interested in what images that people weren't tagging and were passing. And I expected most of them to be these sort of things from our archive collection. Lots of text. <coughs> you kind of have to sit there and study and use your paleography to find out. But that wasn't the case. About half of the ones that people press pass on this term were text heavy. We've got quite a lot of mathematical symbols in our gallimorphy collection, which we passed to tilt factor. Gallimorphy is like, it's our miscellaneous. And uh, we passed those tilt factor, about 3,000 images. We had a lot which I would have thought people would tag, but obviously people don't always want to, they don't always like it. And we thought about taking these images out after the talk from Zooniverse last time where they said, there's always that thing, well, the next one's going to be more interesting, and it keeps you going. You know, it's quite interesting to put those in. But also, maybe these are ones where we need to develop other games for to get the information out. And that's what we're talking to with the archival team, is sort of more transcription, paleography, and looking at the games others have done for that. So, problem solved from crowdsourcing. Well, no, because obviously this has been <laughs> catalogued by our curators as a Chinese book, but obviously the community think it's Japanese. And that's where it doesn't matter what you do, you kind of you always need the expert view. And we're thinking this is the tags as we've added them to our collection site. So if you go into collections now, you can see where there's tags and they're very much identified by the crowd. That maybe it'd be
be nice to have a lift back that people can then downvote. So it's much more interactive. We've done a big load, but we'd like it to be a lot more connecting these two systems up, that people can <coughs> go and say, no, I know that's not Japanese, and downvote it and upvote it. And also where there's no tags that people can go and add them to, to link those two systems together a lot more. So, well, what have we learned? We've been doing this for about six, seven months, I suppose. It's been a really interesting project for us, and it's definitely got us out and about talking to people more. And we know it's not just the crowd, it is communities, and we have to go out and get people to play our games. I think once you're people like Tilt Back to have a community, or Zooniverse that have a big community, you can create new games and people come along and play them. But that's not the case with us. We haven't got that community, so we need to build it up. And that's been very much part of the work that sort of we've been doing. And that you only need simple games. They're not, you know, Scott says, they're not big games. We're not talking Mario Kart here, you know. It's just high school boards, and it is quite addictive once people get into it. The Beanstalk game is really addictive. You just put words in and see it grow. It's, I couldn't get my son off it. Um, why have we done this? Well, just to get simple metadata that can be gathered by people just saying what they see. But you do get, if people know the subject, you get more metadata. So the examples from Tilt Factor is that if people are knowledgeable, you will get information. And it is very much that once we went to the Central Library, it was other librarians, etc., taking part, and they're interested in doing it. So when have we imported them back? Well, after voting and duplication. And that's not a one-off process. We've done it once. We're probably going to revisit, go back over it again. We know there's some spelling mistakes in there. There's other things we could do programmatically, etc. So it is very much an intricate process. And we know it's improved our search and it's improved our engagement. I'd really like to see our Google Analytics shoot up as more and more people can find our images online. But I think that's going to take time. And it's very hard to prove that those things are because of increased metadata, because we find a lot of people linked to our images um, through Facebook, um, when people tweet out, when we have exhibitions going on, and then we see peaks in our usage, so I think it's going to be a gradual process of increasing our traffic. So what's next? Well, more tools, more workflows, trying to get the feedback loop quicker so things are going from the game to collections um, faster, looking more at our voting and also the down voting and see what we do with that, and more research. I think now we're actually creating this um, data set, which we didn't kind of expect that we would have as well, and what we can do with that, and I think there's probably some very interesting research that could be done out there on this data set we've got. Um, hopefully, five people in this room will find help us find those contacts because they're not in the library. And also more analysis. So this is us with the wind in our sails. This is from our lane collection. <laughs> Try to get as many images in my slides when I go places <coughs> of our collection. And these are links. So metadatagames.org is the Tilt Factor Games. Go and play and they've got lots of um, images. They've been working with the British Library and lots of institutions across America. Um, and then I think we're the first sort of UK academic place. This is our library labs where you can go and play our games. And then all our code is open source and online, as is Tilt Factors. And this is our collections. Can everyone see? And then um, I think this is really interesting as well, is that Tilt Factor and Mary is very much behind the crowd consortium in the States. They're setting up events. They've got webinars. Um, they're trying to... In encourage people to do the things, they've got workshops and creating sort of a place for people to go to to find out about crowdsourcing and I think that's really interesting for this group and also what's happening in the UK.